The Lord be with you. <clears throat> the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, o Lord. Now as they went on their way, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. One thing is needful. Mary has chosen the good portion, which shall not be taken away from her. The Gospel of the Lord. In other words, the gospel may since be brought about. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Okay. You can go ahead and get him. When I looked at today's gospel passage in Barclay's commentary, I found a limerick that reminded very, me very much of our own parish secretary, who happens to be right over there, and writes those limericks, and we get to see them in our weekly newsletter. The one there said, Lord of all pots and pans and things, since I've no time to be a saint doing lovely things, or watching late with thee, or dreaming in the dawn light, or storming heaven's gates, make me a saint by getting meals and washing up the plates. Such is Martha of Bethany, a sweetheart, always busy, but only out of love. Jesus stopped at her house, which was near Jerusalem. She lived there with her sister, Mary, and her brother Lazarus. And yes, that Lazarus, the one that's going to die and then be brought back from the dead. At some point, the whole family had become good friends with Jesus. And their home became Jesus' kind of home away from home, whenever he went up to the big city on a pilgrimage or something like that. Last Sunday, as you recall, we heard that wonderful parable of the Good Samaritan, when a scribe of the Torah asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And that was the imperative there. What do I have to do? I have to do something. Part of the lesson was that doing to be done were acts of love. Acts of love toward God and acts of love toward our neighbor. And neighbor can, can include anyone and everyone. At the home of Mary and Martha, it included Jesus. The English saint, the Venerable Bede, wrote, quote, The love of God and our neighbor, which was contained above in words and parables, is here set forth in deed and reality. You might say with Jesus, they were loving both. God and neighbor at the same time. Of course, we love God by loving our neighbor, and we love our neighbor by loving God. There's a balance in a healthy spirituality, integrating being and doing. The Good Samaritan story seems to be all about doing, a rallying cry for charitable works. Next Sunday, we'll turn our attention to prayer with the Lord's Prayer. Lord, teach us how to pray, like John taught his disciples. And today we kind of transition between those two, between the doing and the being. And Jesus' encounter with two women, two sisters, Martha and Mary. One who's all about the doing, and the other who seems to be all about the being. They're often held up as kind of patron saints or models of the active life and the contemplative life among religious. Martha is the active one. She's all into service. Jesus is their guest. And the ancient value of hospitality, since the time of the ancient Bedouin tribes of the Hebrew ancestors, had not faded. Providing a meal and a time of refreshment was a high priority. I'm sure she normally didn't do it all alone. But Lazarus seemed to be out of town. And Mary is not helping out. At least, she's not helping out in the way that Martha would appreciate the most. Perhaps Martha had said something to her sister a few times already, but it just didn't seem to get through. 
Finally, she turns to her guest to find Mary's proper motivation. Jesus, can you, can you tell my sister to come back here and give me a hand? To which Jesus responded, no. I'm sure that a bit of stunned silence followed. Silence filled with perplexity, confusion, perhaps frustration. She had literally voiced a prayer request to God, and God said out loud, no. But Jesus didn't leave her without an explanation. I wonder if he said her name twice to get her to focus on his words, Martha, Martha. You're anxious and troubled about a whole lot of things. Only one thing is really needful, important, primary. Mary has chosen that good portion. Let's not take it away from her. Perhaps she set aside the dishes for later and joined them. I wonder. St. Augustine is very clear about this passage. Martha wasn't doing anything wrong when she was all into service. He said, quote, we must think that the blame was cast upon the service of Martha. Or he, he poses the question, must we think that the blame was cast upon the service of Martha, who was engaged in all the cares of hospitality and rejoiced in having so great a guest? If this be true, let men give up ministering to the needy. In a word, let them be at leisure, intent only upon getting some wholesome knowledge, taking no care what strangers in the village and want of bread. Let the works of mercy go unheeded, knowledge only be cultivated. Our Lord then does not blame the actions, but distinguishes between the duties. For it follows Mary has chosen that good part. Not yours a bad one, but hers a better. Why a better? because it shall not be taken away from her. So Augustine is pointing out that Mary, sitting at the Lord's feet, listening to his stories, learning about him, seeking his wisdom, those are character-building memories that will endure forever. Who would dare rob her of such a precious moment so she can have the memory instead of washing dishes? Augustine's own spiritual mentor, St. Ambrose, commented on this passage, May you then, like Mary, be influenced by the desire for wisdom. For this is the greater, the more perfect work. Not let the care of ministering to others turn your mind from the knowledge of the heavenly word, nor should you reprove or think indolent those who are seeking after wisdom. Oftentimes we feel the urge, the need, the obligation to be busy, to busy ourselves with things that need to get done, things that are good, but things that perhaps can wait, things of lesser importance. What is truly precious is time spent together with friends, with family, with God. Time spent sharing life abiding in each other's company, loving one another, even if nothing practical gets done, that is never time wasted. Do you make time for others? Like Martha, it is easy to get distracted. And more specifically, do you make time for the Lord? It's one of those things that can really easily get lost in the pursuit of a day. You may not feel like you have the time. When something is important, though, you make the time. May the Lord, who made heaven and earth, help you make the time. Make time for what you really need, moments shared, love exchanged. And as with every sermon, no less than this one, I'm always preaching to myself. Psalm 46.10 has always been one of my favorites. Be still then, and know that I am God. That can be a dramatic spiritual pause for someone to actually do that. Just stop. Be still. Don't do anything. Just know that God is there. In the outline of the faith in the 1979 prayer book, the response to the question, what is adoration? 
puts it so well. Adoration is the lifting up of the heart and mind to God, asking nothing but to enjoy God's presence. A missionary friend was talking to me once about the importance of abiding in Jesus in the course of her ministry. At that time, I think they were in Zanzibar. I asked, abiding, can you unpack that a little bit for me? What does that look like? How do you do that? Can you give me a five-point action plan for abiding? <laughs> well, it's not like that. You might say that's, that's kind of a Martha question. If there's an action plan, it would simply be stop. Just be still and know. In John 15, Jesus said, abide in me, and I will abide in you. As the branch can't bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. And in John 6, Jesus said, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Abiding is about communion, sharing life. Do you share your life with God? If so, how? Do you make the time for God in your day, in your week? And if you don't have a plan for that, it probably won't happen on its own. You have to make the time. Make the time for prayer. Make time for Bible or other spiritual reading. Get a daily office app on your phone. Set the timer so it goes off to remind you to pray. Listen to sermons or Catholic podcasts or to spiritual music. Thumb through a prayer book. Touch every page and let the Spirit guide you and stop you where you need to pray. Come to one of the daily Masses during the week if your schedule allows. Come to the Rosary here on Saturday morning. Now, one of the things that I think has made the Rosary so successful in Western spirituality is how it weaves together both the active and the contemplative spiritualities of different people with different temperaments. Each of us in our personality type is more inclined to one or the other. And so for the contemplative, the rosary is meditation, putting yourself there in that biblical scene, just being there, soaking it all in. For the more active personality, you're getting things done, ticking off those short prayers one by one as you go through the beads, gives a sense of movement. You're getting somewhere. You're riding that prayer train all the way around the track. And when you put those beads down, there's kind of a sense of accomplishment. The Lord who created each and every one of us has a special and unique and priceless image of his divinity. And he's, he has a way to get in touch with each and every one of us, to build that communion, that fellowship, in a way that suits you best. Abiding with Jesus. There is an art to it. And it must be learned and developed, and we learn by doing, by sitting down with Mary at the Master's feet. When you come to the altar today, remember that we too have been given the good portion, communion with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So let us never give it up. It won't be taken away. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.